Yeah. Hello, everyone. We were in the middle of uh, an interesting law. Uh, we focused on one law, the law of the harm to the pregnant woman last time. So just to recap, because <laughs> a week passed and also maybe somebody is new today. So let's let's bring in the Aleph Beta summary of the law and then we'll look at the verses and then we'll see another story that it compares to. Verses continue with more laws about people hurting each other. Some guys who are fighting, someone who hits their servant, and then we get to the following scenario. Some men are fighting and they inadvertently hit a pregnant woman. As a result, she has a miscarriage. So what's the punishment for that? Well, it depends. If the assault causes a miscarriage but doesn't kill the woman herself, the men are punished with a fine in court. However, if the woman also dies, Vinatata nefesh tachat nafesh. You shall give a soul in exchange for a soul. So that was the law. And we looked at several peculiarities with this law, in, in the words of this law. Um, so let's start with the peculiarities, the linguistic peculiarities, and then also, what is exactly the punishment? What, what does it mean you should give benatata? Nefesh tachat nefesh, right? If you want to be exact with the Hebrew, then it's really, it doesn't say the word penalty here. It just says give a soul instead of a soul or uh, for a soul. Okay, so then we'll talk about that. How do the rabbis interpret that? Uh, after all, this is unintended consequences. They didn't intend to kill the woman. So let's look at the language. The, the first thing that seems out of place is the v'yatsu yeladeha. Yeah, how come it's more than one child? Yeah, and what yeah. is this v'yatsu? Miscarriage, you can say oh. and the embryo, the, the fetus was killed, died, met, nehrag. There's words much more relevant and on point to say that the fetus was killed. It, it's not that the fetus came out and he's alive, right? That's, uh, this is not a literal translation. You see here, this is from a JPS. But if we go to uh, Shakin Bible, uh, uh, Everett Fox, Professor Everett Fox, I'm sure he's going to say what the Hebrew says. And her, her fetus came out or something like that. Let's see. Uh, no, not the, not the video. Now, there's some strange... Um, so I want to look, uh, switch to to uh, Shaken, to, to Everett Fox. So, do you see the miscarriage results here? Yes. I see. But if we look to the sidebar, uh, for translations, the Shaken Bible, Everett Fox, when men scuffle and deal a blow to a pregnant woman so that her children abort forth. Oh, wow. So he wow. tried to keep it as close as possible. Because in English, it wouldn't make sense to say, and they came out. They, they came out alive or dead. But so I have a couple yeah questions or things that bother me her children it's plural and then so and then what about so there's an impact to the current fetus but what about if it damages her or prevents her from having children in the future says no other damage occurred no wait so so that's a permanent that, that, that's that's a question about the next word. Okay, so this is one oh. peculiarity. The next word is a son. How do we understand this law here a son? If there wasn't be a son, then it's just monetary damages. That's that shall be fine. But then im a son here. So twice the word a son. But if harm is done, so I think we can use the punishment to see to to retroactively or reverse engineer to understand what this a son is. 
if it's just some damage to the woman's ability to that's that wouldn't that wouldn't justify capital punishment. We have a principle. We can, we can only in fact uh, we can only impose capital punishment if if somebody's life was taken away. So the nesatan nefesh tachanefesh, we're going to see how the rabbi struggled with it. Um, but I think that tells us that the ason here is the woman dies. It's that's the harm. And and that's how, uh, you know, when he read it out in the Aleph Beta video, that's how he ah uh, he wrote all the damages in suits, but then he uh, verbally he said that, but that's that's what our our, our um, commentators understand. I think it's a good a good a good uh, point to bring in Rashi and Ibn Ezra. So uh, Rashi. Is, is 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 struggling with this with um why why do we take the person's life it was inadvertent it was it was not it was not uh he didn't intend to kill the woman but there were a lot of capital punishments for other than taking a life um for disobeying your parents you could have capital punishment ah that's true. Yeah. That's true. Yes. Um, yeah. But but yeah. But again, would would the Torah use the word? So so what is so what are you saying that a son? But there's two scenarios. That's that's pretty much very clear. There's two scenarios. There's there's the there's if there is no a son, and if there is a son. So here here you see it right. If if no a son ensues. And if a son ensues, so to me, I, I always thought it's pretty clear. A son means that the woman died, but you're saying that, that what that a son can mean something else. Either either just the fetus died, and a fetus is not a person, because clearly you you only pay a fine, and then the worst situation, the woman dies. Well, what about if she's rendered sterile? That, that's, I think that's the question. Something in between, yes. Ah. Well, yeah. th th this was biblical times when I don't think the state of medical knowledge would be that they would be able to determine that she is yeah. now unable to conceive. Maybe, yeah, okay. That's a, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah. So, so probably that wouldn't come into play when this was written. Yeah. So, but what about what about Talmud? Uh, isn't there a very large discussion about this? Yes, yes, we'll see it right here. Rashi brings it. Okay, so, Nana, you brought it up. So, do, would you like yeah. to read? Okay, <laughs> our rabbis. Uh, what is the meaning of nefesh? Um, uh, our rabbis differ as to the explanation of the word nefesh. The first time it occurs here. There are some who say that it actually signifies life, that is, life for life. Others say that it means monetary compensation, but not literally life. And they say that this must be so because he who intends to kill a certain person and inadvertently kills another instead, as is the case here, is exempt from the death penalty and has only to pay to his heirs his value estimating this as though he were sold as a slave in the market okay so that's but there's other i know that there's uh i can't can't quote you the chapter or anything but i know there's much further discussion about this um in in the talmud yeah yeah so ibn Ezra has even further discussion about it you're right so Ibn Ezra tries to bring the uh, reasons for each side of this debate of whether it's a capital, the words nefesh tacha nefesh means you take his life, uh, presumably after, after a trial, or just it's monetary, it's still monetary. So what would be the difficulty with those who say, no, it means that he has to pay for, for, the, for the life of the woman that he took? What would be the difficulty with that? Why, why is that what what how would you challenge those who explain that way 
she's property and you know her she's has no worth once uh you know once she's damaged yeah so right how, how is it worse then if if you're saying if she didn't die pay a penalty and then you say if she did die also pay then where's where's the disaster here where's the harm the extra harm where's the where's the extra this this whole the way it's phrased as two scenarios one the lesser and one the more severe but if you're giving the same punishment then how is it more severe so he's going to talk about that he's going to say Ibn Ezra, look on the right. But if any harm follow, uh, we find a difference of opinion. Some say, do you see what I'm reading? Yes. yes. That the one who caused the woman's death is put to death because he intended to kill a fellow Israelite. They offer us proof. That's uh, mm -hmm. Is that felony murder? No, it's manslaughter. Yes. yes, yes. Oh, well, if he intends to kill the yeah. fellow Israelite, yeah, but, that's murder. Yeah. Okay. But, oh, but Shemaya, I thought the whole idea was that he didn't intend to, to kill them. That was an accident. No, he Isn't intended that, to kill no, them. He, he, they, fought, they fought. They fought each other. That was with intent. That, that cannot be by mistake. You're saying maybe they fought, but he tended just to injure him. So, so okay. that's interesting. That, I think, no, I think there was intent to kill here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, they offer us proof of the fact that scripture states he shall surely be fine with regard to the children, but it states with regard to the woman, thou shalt give life for a life. Nefesh tacha nefesh. Now, if the reference is to a fine, then in what way is the woman's death worse than that of the children? On the other hand, if we say that one is to be punished with death for killing the children, why did scripture alter its style and read life for life? The opposing opinion maintains that one who intends to kill one individual and kills another is not put to death. And the reason the Torah altered its language and stated life for life is that the fine for killing the person is much greater than that for killing an embryo. Mm -hmm. So they understand this nefesh tacha nefesh, not literally, but it's a bigger, larger fine. We, a soul was taken here, so we need to increase the fine significantly to deter. That's mm -hmm. that's the the worst scenario, but still not not um, executing the offender. Shemai, is this the only place where the phrase the <laughs> nefesh nefesh appears? No, uh, no, it appears. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think in Emor in Vaikra, because uh, I but, thought. Uh, because I thought that 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 meant to kill. I I, I thought that was accepted. I, I I didn't know that there was. Yeah, no, no. There's a big debate that that those who think that it's still monetary uh, are are basically opposed to capital punishment. They don't want the Torah to be uh, seen as such a cruel uh, justice system where you get. Uh, capital punishment when again this was a fight okay so you even though he intended to kill the other person when two or more parties fight and and clearly though the pregnant woman was not the intent there was no intent to kill her so her killing is totally inadvertent and they they have a difficult time in 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 say in justifying capital punishment and so that that's the other opinion and uh, that's how they also understand the next verse, ayin tachat ayin, eye for an eye. That's become a rallying cry of Christians against the, our, our, you know, our Torah, saying that this is the cruelty of the Hebrew Bible. But mm -hmm. the, the rabbis interpreted it. No, it's it's and, and he and he he says that the latter is not to be taken literally, right? So that if that's monetary, then why the 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 phrase previous the previous just before it why should that be taken literally they so those who say it's monetary say you have to read it in context just like the rest ein tachat ein eye for an eye shen tachat shen tooth for a tooth and we don't actually chop off their limbs we don't actually you have to pay the value of that hand that you that you've injured that you've um, caused the person to lose or or the tooth it, it's uh, I, I question yeah if the woman is not pregnant and two men are fighting and one pushes into the 
non-pregnant woman and she dies, are the rules exactly the same? That that would be cause for for mur for killing the perpetrator? Is there something unique yeah. about the pregnant woman as opposed to any woman yeah. or for a man for that matter? That it's just an accidental killing, like an involuntary right. manslaughter. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of discussion. In, in, uh, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of discussion about that because it seems to be a general rule, and the only extra part that was added was what with the embryo with the fetus that that complicates it. But really, you're right. It, the law should be the same, regardless if for, for her for killing of the woman, whether she's pregnant or not. How, how does right? How does losing the fetus make her death worse? It should be the same. Her death it's is, not, is it's not her death. It's the husband's what the what is due to the husband. And and clearly killing both uh is a is a loss for him. Yeah, I mean you can look at it as a financial loss or as an emotional loss. Interesting. But um the so, so this this phrase is is really um, there's a lot, a lot of debate around this phrase and all, all these ayin tachas ayin shen tachas shen, and it seems that the rabbis in the Talmud wanted to um, to liberalize, so to speak, these laws because I think the pshat is actually yes, you kill the man. Uh, let's go now to the story of Joseph. That appears there. That phrase. Nefesh Kshurav and Afsho. And it seems to me in his life, his life, if if Benjamin, so that was that was what we started talking about last week uh, last week. If if Benjamin's life will will end because of this taking him down to Egypt, Jacob's life will end. So we saw that in the um in the speech that Judah makes. So let's see that. Um Yeah, let's summarize the, the other connections that we saw um, with the between the two stories. You wouldn't normally think uh, of of these connections. Uh, so, oh, but this is the this bar. Okay, so on the left you see the pregnant woman law, and on the right the Joseph story, and particularly the speech that Judah made. So her her fetuses came out. That that strange language, which really was trying to say that the fetus was killed, was in a miscarriage happened. And here, that same verb, Jacob describes how Joseph went away. Then the Asan, we just spoke about it. The only other place, my mother uh, made a great point. Uh, she asked me, what about other places in the Bible? So I looked it up. It's really the only two places in the whole Bible hmm. that this word appears. I'll show you. I did a search on the online concordance, and and here's what came up. So, you know, we live in an era. We can do this. I put the word Asan here. It's, uh, it's called Snoopy.com. And... And so these three verses are all Joseph's story. They're all when 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 Jacob tells them, uh, says, "I'm not giving you Benjamin because he will have a son." Uh, then um, he tells them, "Oh, that's the narrator saying it." Then it's a quote from Jacob saying, uh, "I'm not going to let you have Lo Yered Bni Machem because his brother died and he's remained alone. Benjamin is now the only son from from Rachel." A son, a son will happen to him. And then the third time is that when Judah is talking to Joseph and says, a son. The next is our law, Shmot. That's what we just read, that if there won't be an son with a pregnant woman, or there will be. And the next is only Talmud, Masechet Ketuvot. In other words, in the entire Bible, these are the only two places where you have a son. So I think that strengthens the mm. connection. Okay. And then the final connection was 
Uh, oh, sorry. Um, the life for life. So the penalty should be life for life or nefesh tacha nefesh. And, and the same nefesh and nefesh. So it's not, it's not tachat. The connecting word here is bound up, kshua, in the Joseph story. Yehuda is telling the ruler, Joseph, uh, but for him, it's just the, the viceroy of Egypt. Uh, if I bring him down here, this will cause uh, terrible, um, something terrible to happen to my father. And his life is bound up with Benjamin's life. In other words, my father's life is bound up. That's the, that's the meaning here, with whose life is own life. And then the the uh the um should we say the uh uh the theme of the, the 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 highlight of these connections is that this whole law is right next to the law about one who kids up another party and then sells them the gonev ishu mechoro and the whole essence of the joseph story is about kidnapping and selling right right, right? okay so so those are all the connections. And now we're going to bring it all together uh, for a very interesting insight that the uh, Rabbi Ami Silver and Aleph Beta uh, had to make between what, what on the face of it has no connection, but now that we've seen all these connections, what's the idea behind it? things going on here. Let's start with that last line, soul for a Joseph and his brothers. I think that these parallels may actually be touching on something at the very core of the entire Joseph story. You see, if you were to ask most people, why did the brothers hate Joseph? They'd say that's easy, because he was Jacob's favorite son, he had a special coat, he was a bit of a tattletale, and he had these dreams about ruling over his brothers. But it's actually not so simple because the roots of the brothers' hatred that caused them to kidnap and sell Joseph as a slave actually began way before any of this, before Joseph's dreams, before Jacob gave him that special coat, even before any of them was born. It began with Jacob's love for Rachel. Rachel was Jacob's beloved wife, and Joseph was her firstborn son. That's why Jacob loved him, and it's the reason the brothers hated him. It wasn't just about Joseph. It was about the way Jacob favored one mother over the other, and how in turn he favored one set of children over the others. And Joseph bore the brunt of all of that. Now come back to Mishpatim. We find these laws about kidnapping and selling someone, laws that remind us of the sale of Joseph, lumped together with laws about hitting and cursing parents. Maybe those laws aren't misplaced after all. Maybe they're grouped together to show us the context, the backstory of the whole struggle between Joseph and his brothers. The brothers kidnapped and sold Joseph, but they just as easily could have hit or cursed their parents. Because when it comes down to it, they were the real source of all this anger and jealousy. But the brothers didn't acknowledge that. All they saw was little Joseph prancing around with his coat and his dreams and they took it all out on him. But their anger was misguided. It really all stemmed from their parents. Now, that's not to say the brothers should have attacked their parents. It's not like everything would have been hunky-dory if they just hit and cursed mom and dad instead of poor Joseph. <laughs> but I do think this is showing us what the real issue was. The real problem was an inequality in the love between the parents, which trickled down to the next generation. But nobody addressed that issue and everybody suffered because of it. Just imagine how things would have played out differently if Jacob, his children, and his wives had all gone for some good old family therapy, if they all got in a room together and talked it out. Joseph, do you realize what it's like to see you walking around in that coat? Dad, why did you always love Rachel more than our mother? Do you know how that makes us feel? The brothers may have realized that their anger wasn't about their little brother after all. And the entire sale of Joseph may have never taken place. But that didn't happen. And instead, it took years of anguish and suffering before they could come around and make amends. 
I think that now we can also understand the parallels we see later in that same section of laws between Judah's speech and the woman who suffers a miscarriage. Because what's going on there is that some men are fighting. But who do they hurt? They hurt a mother. A mother carrying children. Well, once upon a time, some men were fighting. Ten men launched an attack against their brother. But beneath it all, they were attacking his mother. They were lashing out at Rachel. And this seems to be how Jacob experienced it. Because as far as Jacob is concerned, losing Joseph was a miscarriage. He didn't just lose his son, he lost Rachel's son. What pained him and plagued him for all these years was the loss of the mother's child. And so when he thinks back to that terrible loss, he says, Yatsam iti. He speaks about it like a miscarriage. Then, when he's facing the risk of losing Benjamin, Rachel's second son, he calls it an ason, that word that's reserved for a mother's death. Because even though Rachel had already been dead for years, as long as Benjamin was alive, Jacob still had a vestige of her in his life. But losing Benjamin would mean losing his final link to Rachel. She'd be gone forever. That's the tragedy he fears. And it would be so devastating that if it were to happen, Jacob could not go on living. Nafsho kshura b'nafsho. Jacob's attachment to Benjamin would result in nefesh tachad nafesh, one soul lost on account of the other. Something we've noticed time and time again at Aleph Beta is that the stories of the Torah become laws. That oftentimes the most painful and difficult experiences of the past show up later in legal terms. As if within the Torah's laws, there is a commentary on those earlier stories showing us where things went wrong and how to repair mistakes of the past. When we see the laws and the stories interacting this way, all of a sudden it becomes very real. The Torah isn't just spinning ancient legal theory or telling stories about characters that lived long ago. The stories and laws are speaking to complex human experiences, the same kinds of things that you and I run into in our own relationships. We face these same pitfalls. We also cause damage when we're blinded by feelings of anger or jealousy and fail to discern the real cause of those feelings. By giving legal structures to these stories, the Torah is giving us both a warning and a salve. It's showing us where our ancestors went wrong and how we can avoid repeating those same mistakes. And if the damage has already been done, it's showing us ways we may still be able to repair it. I hope you enjoyed this video. The truth is, the links to the Joseph story we saw here are just scratching the surface. There are many more Joseph references scattered throughout the laws and Mishpatim. Okay. So, very interesting uh, connection. Yeah. yeah. I like I like that uh, scene where they all go to family therapy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they look like Dr. Ruth there in the background. <laughs> yes, Maybe. but... Oh, yes, but Shema, if they if they really would have gone to family uh, therapy, then we wouldn't be here, right? Because yeah. there'd be no Jewish people, right? So, right that that led to the right the Egyptian uh, bondage, slavery, and then the exodus. right, right. So there's the silver lining you're set you're saying, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. But very interesting connection and very it's a drush, I think, but very interesting and very insightful drush. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you. Thanks.